this is a talk from Four Children's recent Troubled Families Conference, entitled Better Futures for Troubled Families, Helping to Turn Lives Around. The talk is given by Sarah Thomas, Havering Council's Early Help and Troubled Families Lead, and Michael Forsyth from Millie Systems. The talk is entitled Monitoring Outcomes and Future Implications, where Sarah talks in depth around Havering's outcomes, approach and learnings, and how Illy have helped support their work.
international space to actually um, commissioning some very specific support. For example, um, we've got Women's Aid work coming in. We've got um, some um, additional support within our match, trying to make it a one front door. So we've got an early help researcher within our match team. And we've got service level agreed. So we're not just giving money internally. We're saying we want this for it. You know, this is the level of, of, of um, quality we expect. This is what we expect back. So that's been really helpful in terms of driving that quality. It's worth explaining that within Havering, the Troubled Families, I can only describe us as more of a commissioning unit because we don't have a frontline team. But to us, Troubled Families is everyone's business. We don't refer to Troubled Families, you know, and say, oh, well, you know, the Thomas family worked with. You know, we identify that you're working with families that meet the criteria, and then we obviously liaise with that professional, which means we've got lead workers in schools, um, family mosaic, in prospects, action for children, we've got them in our children's centres, so we've got them all over the place. We've got a health visitor, um, even Job Centre Plus has got one. And so, so some of that is it's about making it sustainable by embedding it in the day-to-day -day work of everybody and getting the systems over that to make sure that we're meeting their needs. So, because there are so many people that are involved in our business and um, in terms of troubled families, it was really important that we managed to look just not at the local authorities' outcomes, but the programme's outcomes that involved everybody else as well. So, buying when we start looking at a system or a process, we have in just an electronic system. I think that um, we say it all starts all earlier on when we say just don't run the IT system. You know, I have to smile to myself because we've all been there and we've all got so many different systems. And the other thing that we're trying to cope with was all the change going on in health and these ECGs and all their systems and the police changes in their systems. And it was almost like we were trying to get partners around the table and put these new expectations and measures on them at a time when they were fit to burst in as well. So it needed to add value to all of our work and that was a real, real challenge. The other thing that we needed to, not just within the local authority, but the Metropolitan Police and even the academies, because they had boards they had to go to and help, was to make sure that we had a credible cost analysis system. Because one of the things that we wanted to do was about the investment and understanding where that, that savings come from, has come from. We talked about the family intervention, the old FIP kind of um, research that had been done, which showed criminal justice system being one of the biggest winners, for want of a better word, in the old kind of FIP family uh, total place. Um, that was in the, the, the past the previous government, but actually we didn't want anecdotal information, we wanted local information, and we needed everyone to be signed up to that, not just the local authority, but all of our partners too, so that meant we had to have a system that they were signed into that was credible, and that they believed the information that was coming out. Because the police, for example, if we're saying to them, you're the biggest you know, winners in this, can you give us some resource then, please, to reinvest so that you can win even more? You know, we wanted to make sure they were signed up to that system if that was the story we were going to come out with eventually um, and we'd be able to evidence that. But I'm not quite sure that is the story. So, the, the PBRs, the, the actual identifying the families, is still behaving at the moment, we've still got quite a way to go on that. We've got that, we've actually identified over 95% of our families. And, um, but it's been a long time coming. It's been a hard work, and I think, to be honest, one of the, the things for us has been welfare reforms, and how that's seen a huge influx in families coming into Havering. Uh, for those of you who don't know where we are, we're in East London, out in London, Borough. So, We've seen a lot of migration from, from inner London to outer London. We've got other outer London boroughs that have got properties in our borough as well. So I'm thinking Newham, Waltham Forest, they've actually got their own uh, private sector lease and council housing in our borough. So families have been moved into Haven, and that's because relatively the properties have been a bit cheaper. So we've seen quite an influx of families that have come to our borough since April. To the point, I'll give you a good example when we didn't actually think we were even going to identify one of the figures, and that was April, and now we've identified as good as our whole um, cohort within six months since. So that's taken a tremendous amount of work for us, and, and having a system to support that has been really helpful. Um, just before Travel Families was actually.
actually introduced um, the Hoping House something called the Top 100 Grammys. And we've done a really interesting piece of work where we had actually written out to all our partners and our agencies and asked them to identify their high cost, high contact families. And I was saying to them, if you've got one up on the computer, don't worry about it. You know who they are, they're in the forefront of your mind. And um, I think we had about 40 schools was supplied. Um, we had health visitors, we had first stops, we had commission services. And it was um, from anecdotal to reality, what we actually identified there was probably around about 30% of those, because what we did then were matched. So schools identified the child, first stop identified the adult, and health visitors might do both. And we, we did a big matching exercise and put them together in family groups. And we also asked everyone to identify the complex need that they were aware of within that family. So you can imagine some of these families were getting multiple hits. Not one agency was able to identify all the issues of all the families, though, all the family members. And more significantly was there were families with toxic trio issues that not one agency was able to identify with. And then on top of that, you know, if you've got preschool children in a toxic trio family, actually, I'd want to be concerned about that. I'd want to make sure there was a thorough assessment, at least, undertaken with, that, to, uh, undertaken with that family to understand the level of risk and see if that was manageable or not. And these families were going under the radar. So there was clearly a, system, a need here. And that wasn't about information sharing, that was about communication. Because these families are likely to have had caps or single assessments or whatever it is that you, you do in your authorities. So that was a real issue. Domestic violence is another one. A lot of families have domestic violence, but what we, were, we, we weren't actually drilling down to understand what that was. So we, we used domestic violence, actually quite anecdotally, if I'm honest. I want to know what it is. Is it current or is it historic? Because there is a difference in how you actually work with it. There's a difference in terms of the risk of child, and there's a difference in terms of what health and support I've got to put into that family. So we need to start talking the common language. We need to put some conventions, if you like, around some of these issues that we're all working with, and we're all talking about, but actually we're talking about them sometimes in a different ways. So actually by introducing a system that we're all feeding into, those conventions started to come out in terms of that common language. One of the other things, that there are other issues there about, and I'll give you an example. I've got here welfare reforms and housing rears and debt management, etc. Family in Haven with 10 children, and um, they are our worst family affected by the welfare reforms. When they came in April, that family lost £500 a week, and which meant their housing benefits stopped. So they were living on their income support, and of course, they went to arrears immediately. Now, it's an interesting family because they were not engaging with us. The children had previously um, been. Um, had an interim care order, and the father had taken the council to court to, to actually have that care order overturned. There was, and the, the, the interim care order was around domestic violence and the, and the risk of children within the home. So we had quite a formidable character in there. And, um, and he didn't just sit, he saw social care as a whole of the council. So um, we wanted to go and talk to him about the negative impact welfare reforms we're going to have. So we contacted the health visitor and said, could you please go and have a chat with this family? Usually in universal service, usually one of the most families welcome in six families. So a key part to the approach we took was making sure that we kept it simple and making sure we hammered home three points. The first were to make sure it was a communication tool that really did support multi-agency working. Secondly, that it enabled practitioners to take a whole family approach and thirdly, able to automate the PBR claims and support outcomes reporting. And I know Sarah's going to talk in more detail how important this intelligence is and in feeding into investment strategies and commissioning needs. From an operational perspective, we can see from the, the, the slides, um, one of the key challenges was pulling together all of the existing information that the data team had already collated. 
So what we did is we worked together to merge this into a single record and import into the system. From there, this provided this unique view of the data so that we could automate the PBR claims, but also so we could look at performance management and analysis across the cohorts, looking for commonalities and pulling out that level of intelligence and analysis possible. The second part then is obviously for the lead professional, making sure that they now have this single view of the household. And what's brilliant is they're able to coordinate the team around the family, but also communicate effectively as well. And with this, the third part is the bringing in the partner agencies. So, looking at public services, the voluntary sector, those that have been commissioned, as well as existing council services. And what it meant is, obviously, you've got this single platform that is centralised, everyone's able to access. And it means we're sharing information in real time so that we're making informed decisions and communicating key events and high-impact alerts.
Trump family's phase two. And I'm predicting that Trump family's phase two will expect a lot more from us in terms of the data that we're actually giving and providing to um, the, the government machine, if you like, the ECLG. So um, I think that in Trump families, the current phase, the focus has been very much on the criteria, on identifying families, on starting to work with them, on getting the models together. There's a big push now on, you know, at, at, at all your families, can you tell me which ones have got domestic violence that are current in the story? Which ones have got class one, two, you know, kind of drug use? Is that the mother, father? Is that the, you know, is that the young person? So I think that we, I mean, when, when we had the Acorus uh, telephone interview, and they were saying, can hey, bring give us information on this, 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 or yes, 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 no, yes. I was thinking, blind. They actually do are going to require the ins and outs. It's not just about whether a family a, a child is going to attend school. It's right down to the money shy of are they in council house, you know, council tax there, are they in housing debt, what is their tendency? Are they a council tenants? Are they private tenants? I don't know how much information you know about your families at the moment at the touch of a button. Hopefully we do, because we can start we've started to record this on the system. So I can tell you out of how many of our families, how many are in council housing, how many are in RSLs, how many are in private sector, how many are in um, PSLs, and really start dividing them down. That helps us in terms of the particularly incentivising or you know, the carrot and stick approach. You know, we'll, we'll give you this council house if you agree to work with us. So there's opportunities there. Of course, just kind of bringing it all the way back, we've got a lot of intelligence about our families, we've got intelligence, we, we communicate, we've got customers, we've got our partners on board, we know the makeup of our families, and now we need to, it kind of goes further then, just to try to identify which intervention, I can actually stop mapping which lead professionals or which lead agencies are getting the best outcomes. And actually, you know, there is an issue here about quality and about approach. And actually, health visitors are great, so look at as universal service. Social workers know that they, they take your kids away, don't they? So I can actually start measuring in terms of engagement. Actually, it could be I send a health visitor along to try to get the real social worker on a joint visit, to try to get that family engaged. It's not just about a bit work and going in and being consistent. We've got to be cute about which professionals are asking the family. So I think that with this system being able to map that which professionals are achieving and um, which ones are taking a bit longer, actually is that a training and development issue? Is that a quality issue? Is that a communication issue? What it actually does is flag an alert in terms of what I want to look at and focus on in terms of the way that staff are working and in terms of the outcome they're getting and in terms of training and development. So it's about making sure that we're using all this intelligence or in a big circle to inform you know, where our priorities should be. And I know that's kind of, you know, we talk about commissioning needs, and I know that sounds um, like 
Thank you very much for listening and if you have any questions please feel to get in touch on the emails below.